Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's episode. We've got critiques and of course a new edit for you guys, but first I just want to take a minute here at the outset to talk to you guys about raw files. And the reason is I've noticed we've been getting a lot of submissions in the JPEG format from people whose cameras support shooting in raw. And I just wanted to stress the importance that if you're planning on doing any editing to your photos at all, you're gonna to wanna to shoot in the raw mode. And what shooting in raw mode is going to do for you is it's gonna give you the ability not only to adjust the white balance after you've taken the shot, which is something you can't do when you shoot in JPEG, but it's also gonna give you a lot more data for your image, and that's gonna give you a higher quality image output and much better control over the edit to your photo. Now, maybe you aren't sure if your camera shoots in raw mode, so be sure to check your manual and see if your camera supports it. But pretty much all of the recent DSLRs support raw mode, as well as a bunch of the prosumers and high-end point shoots. So if your camera supports RAW, make sure to change over to shooting RAW instead of JPEG. And if you're already shooting in RAW, be sure that when you submit your files to us for these episodes that you send us the RAW files. Now let's go ahead and get into the first critique. All right, everyone, I'm here once again with Jordan Lake, and we're taking a look at our first photo critique for this episode, which was submitted to us by James Verfline. And we've got a panorama shot that was taken with an iPhone 5. Um, I really like the view in this shot. Uh, Jordan, you want to talk about this a little bit? Uh, yeah. Well, I think it's it's a pretty photo. The sky is great. It's a great capture. I think I've actually been here. Um, what's the name of this place, Matthew? I think this is uh, maybe Caribbean Beach. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I've been here. Um, yeah, it's a really great photo. Um, improvements. I, I have a, I have an iPhone, so I know exactly how difficult it is to capture panorama. They tried to do their best to guide you, but um, you kind of start and then end wherever it's going to end. So I think yeah. the first distraction for me is the hand and the walkway and the people on the right, which is just a, a, a simple crop. Um, and we both agreed on that. Yeah. And then perhaps the biggest distraction for me are the five chairs that are um, sitting right in center frame. Um, not much you can really do about that besides like to pick them up and put them behind you, but um, I don't think you'd want to do that. Yeah. I, th I think I mentioned, and this is probably a, a little crazy, you could have maybe laid them all flat and then uh, you could just Photoshop them out using the clone stamp tool. Well, you could still Photoshop them out using the clone stamp tool, but anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, I'm always looking at contrast and color, so immediately it just looks flat and I want to see more contrast, um, mm -hmm. especially in the sand area. The water's yeah. not as bad, and I could even get away with the sky the way it is. But mm -hmm. the sand just looks washed out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I think contrast um, would help in this photo and post. Yeah. Um, just trying to think of other things that they could have done immediately. I think the composition is... I'm not sure how much more you could have done with the composition. I'm not aware of the surroundings but um mm -hmm. well uh, i'm not sure you know what's over here on the left but i think it might have been cool if you went to the center of these two cots or hammocks here and then you'd have a hammock on the left and right kind of framing the image out into the beach that could have been right. cool yeah um, but you know i can't say that for sure because i'm not sure what else is over there other than the little bit that i can see but just something to keep in mind for for next time but definitely Get rid of this on the right. Just crop it off. Don't want to see it. Probably right where the trees are. And I think that'll make a much stronger image. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank well, you, James Verfline. Thanks, James. And now let's move on to image two. All right. And our second photo here was submitted by Suzanne Quarchani. Uh, we've got a picture in Magic Kingdom of Tomorrowland. Uh, Jordan, take it away. Uh, the colors are the first thing that really stand out to me on this one, and the reflections, and I think 
this photo has, well, it it had a lot of potential. The problem is that um, this was shot in JPEG, and so the blacks are pretty much done. They are they are toasted. So we can't really pit, we can't really pull a lot back from the blacks. Um, yeah, so it looks like it was a Coolpix L820, so I'm not even sure if it has raw or not. Maybe. So I probably would have bracketed. I don't know. Could they have bracketed on that camera? I don't know. I'm looking it up. Because you you can tell right in the middle of the frame, those highlights there on the rocks, they're blowing out and so the only the only way to get a better expo exposure is to make the darks darker um which doesn't help any so you probably have to bracket the shot to get a little a little more detail in the darker areas and that's that's really what i just want to see i just want to see a little bit more detail in the darker areas um i don't really think it has to be like full-blown hdr where you see 100% detail everywhere. I think there's something to be said about having deep shadows too because that deep dark water is, you know, it's pretty cool looking. Yeah. I just like to see a little bit more detail. Yeah, I mean, it looks like I, I did find the camera and it looks like it only shoots in JPEG. So, you know, with that limitation in mind, I probably would have tried to expose this a little bit brighter. Um, and then you could have maybe brought down some of the overexposed areas a little bit. I'm not saying to, you know, go way out of control and, you know, two or three stops brighter than what we've got, but maybe just a little brighter so that we can see a little bit more detail in the plants on the left and right. And then, you know, I think everything else looks pretty good. The, the neon colors are actually pretty spot on and the reflection looks fantastic. Um, so I think if we just got a little bit of extra brightness we'd really have a you know a much better image i do like the the framing uh, they got low and there isn't a whole lot of distractions in it so the framing was was nice too yeah i think it was taken from the rose garden so this may be uh, an image that can't even be retaken in the future because uh, i believe they're getting rid of it they're working on it right now but uh anyway thanks suzanne for submitting this photo to us all right, so we're moving on to image number three, which was submitted to us by Nick Daly. We've got a picture from the new Fantasyland area. This is uh, the cove area on the new Ariel Little Mermaid ride. And Jordan, what did you think of this photo? Uh, this one kind of reminded me of the photo that you retouched last week. Um, you can tell by the sky, it, the little bit of it there is looks like it was maybe overcast day you can kind of tell that the shadows are not very deep and it the image could have some contrast to it the colors seem to be a little bit more Muted. um they seem to pop a little bit more than oh, than the oh. other one but i think this one could use the same kind of treatment with uh a little bit more contrast um maybe a bit of dodging and burning in uh, the rock areas to kind of make them um, make them pop out because right now the rocks appear to be on one flat plane. Yeah, uh, you know, just make the shadows a little deeper on the rocks with the dodging and burning. Uh, like you said, it's you know we've got the sky is probably overcast or at least you know pretty patchy that day, and so everything again is flat, more contrast. But I do like it. Looks like they probably use an ND filter. Uh, for this shot because you've got the nice long exposure uh, waterfalls there and that looks really great. I love when people you know take the time to use the ND filters during the day so we probably shot this with a tripod as well to to get that uh, to get that nice look so great job with that. Um, I just like to see for me uh, I would increase you know the color in the water at the bottom. Um, I think that would really help it stand out course uh, a little bit more color in the rocks especially where the, there's like some reddish tones I'd like to see those reds come out a little more the greens on top of the hill and the foliage on the left I'd like to see the greens maybe pop a little bit more as well but overall I, I think this is a really great photo and I actually really like the composition as well yeah I don't think that there's anything in here that really is distracting if I had to 
yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't really change the composition at all. I mean that there's nothing in here that that says we need to crop this differently or move how we're looking at things. And um the only piece of constructive criticism as far as editing anything out, I would say the only real distraction are the little lanterns in the kind of in the middle right. Mm-hmm. Um but that I would leave that up to you know your creative your creative work whether or not you feel like that needs to be left in or not. I mean this is this image is almost there. It just needs a little bit more editing and it's done. Yeah, I think I could go either way with the lanterns. Uh, with a daytime shot, I I mean either way, if it was nighttime, I I think I'd be much more interested in those lanterns there because they'd be giving off some light and you'd have a little bit more interest going on there, but yeah, I agree. I mean, you could go either way with getting rid of them. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to our next image. Now, our fourth image was sent in to us by Jessamy Arce. Uh, this was an image that, as soon as I saw it, I actually was really interested in what she did here. I really liked that she took the different Little Mermaid Vinylmation characters and took it there to the new Little Mermaid ride. The uh, first thing that stood out to me, though, I... She has a really shallow depth of field that she was playing with to kind of try and blur the castle in the background. Um, but it looks like in doing so, we actually have such a shallow depth of field that we lost focus on Ursula, Flounder, and Sebastian. So maybe just increase the depth of field on this image just a little bit so that we get all the, the Vinylmation characters in focus. And we'll still have a nice out-of-focus kind of background with the castle. Uh, the other thing that I was thinking, I, I like the castle in the background, but if you, maybe if you had stood up just a little higher and kind of shot down onto the vinylmation, we would have had more of the castle in the background. And I just think it would have been more interesting if, if there was a little less blue sky at the top and more of the castle behind the vinylmation characters. I would I would agree with everything that you said. Um, the only thing I would add to that is personally more more castle view would be fine with me that would be great but what I would like to see is the characters offset from the castle just a little bit so ideally I'd like to see that castle shifted a little bit to the left more more along the the rule of thirds line on the left and then the characters shifted off to the right and this uh, this would help separate, I think, the characters from the background, um, and play a little bit more with the space because there's a lot going on in the space on the right, um, which there's nothing there. But the sky the sky is great, the exposure is great, the colors are really great. I mean, you could you could edit this to make them pop just a little bit more, um, draw the users or the viewer. I always say user, but because uh, <laughs> I'm a developer. Um, the viewer's eye uh, back toward uh, toward the characters. So, yeah, you you could saturate all the colors just a little bit. I mean, they're they're not super popping, but the colors are nice. They're accurate. So you could go either way. Is you know what you wanted to do with that? Maybe the sky being a little bit bluer would be nicer. Uh, but- the, I guess the only other perhaps counter argument to the depth of field. Um, and where a very shallow depth of field might work in this case is if there wasn't such a hard line implied. So for me, when I look at this photo, I I get the impression that they sh- they're kind of all standing in a line together. They're all on that same plane. Whereas if you maybe made some of them further away and some a, a bit closer... Then you could definitely work with um, that that shallow depth of field where not all of them would have to be uh, in focus. Right. Yeah. It's just that the Ariel, Prince Eric are so close to the same you know distance from us at, as Flounder and Sebastian that when I see them out of focus, it just doesn't work for me. Yeah. Yeah, that would be that would be the fix for it. But other than that, it's a great photo. Yeah. 
we both, uh, as soon as we saw it, we both really liked this photo and wanted to talk about it. So great job, Justin, and uh, thanks for sending the photo in. All right, so our fifth image was submitted to us by Caleb Ruckel. And Caleb actually submitted a bracket, which is multiple exposures for one image. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later because this is going to be the photo that we're editing this week. But we've got basically a straight down view towards the castle on Main Street. And also fireworks from the Wishes show that we're going to be combining together into one image. Jordan, what did you want to say about this particular image? Uh, well, I don't think that there is too much to say as far as composition. Um, everything is straight and centered. Um, and the exposure is great. The bracket was great. Um, one of the photos that was sent in, which I don't think was a part of the bracket, I think it was his final edit, um, had people, uh, like a rustling, uh, rustling, bustling people, which looked really cool, and it had fireworks in the background. Um, I think you're going to show that in the video as we're talking about it, right? Yeah, so we're going to we we're gonna combine it? the fireworks and the bracket into a final image, but I'm, I'm going to show both of those here. Okay, so in that image, uh, which I can tell by the file name, I'm assuming that that is what his final edit image was. Um, I'm I'd not have sure to... about that. I think I think that may have just got named that way when I exported it from Lightroom. Oh, okay. Um, well, then that's the only photo I can provide a critique on, and it's too yellow. <laughs> so <laughs> you would um, say that. Yeah. So it's just uh, just needs some color correcting. Um, that's the only thing I can really provide, but. And I guess that's why it's a good photo for this week's episode because he's got a bracket and it's a perfect way to show how to combine bracketed images. So Yeah, it's, it's going to be really cool to show you guys how to combine kind of these firework images with a bracketed image. Um, I, I could even take just the firework image by itself with the people and, and I think that would be a, a cool image as well with the people. You could go either way with it. Of course, you know, the, the one with the, the people is much too yellow for some reason. I guess the white balance got thrown off by the fireworks. But uh, I think it's going to be a really cool image. And I'm going to go ahead and show you guys how, uh, how to do that. We're going to be touching in Lightroom. We're going to be touching in Photomatics. And then finally in Photoshop. So you guys are going to get to see a lot of stuff in this episode. All right, everyone, let's jump right into this week's edit. Uh, we've got a picture here from Caleb that he submitted, the picture of Main Street that we were just talking about along with a picture of wishes that he took uh, probably prior to taking this shot. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select our baseline image, which is kind of the image that's not over or underexposed. You'll, if you look through all these images, you'll see they get progressively brighter. That's a under image. So this one here is just kind of in the middle. So we're going to start with this one. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bump the exposure probably by about 0.4 and then I'm also going to dial back the contrast probably about minus 20 and I do that because I'm going to add contrast back in later and it, I find it easier to edit the images when I've dialed the contrast back the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull my highlights down to around minus 50 and I'm going to bump my shadows to about plus 50 I don't touch my whites or my blacks when I'm doing HDR work. Photomatics tends to produce weird results when you use these two, so we're going to skip those. The white balance actually looks all right, so I'm not going to mess with that, but if you need to, you can always adjust your white balance temperature and tint here. I'm not going to touch clarity, vibrance, or saturation at this point. We'll do that in Photoshop later. So I'm going to scroll all the way down here to the bottom where we see lens correction and I'm going to check the enable profile corrections and remove chromatic aberration box. The profile correction as you can see basically corrects the vignetting and distortion that the lens caused and the remove chromatic aberration if you're not aware of what that does oftentimes you'll see little green or purple fringes throughout your image 
and by checking that box it's going to get rid of those uh, artifacts. Now finally let's come down here and click the level button and that's basically going to allow Lightroom to just go ahead measure the image and straighten everything up for us. In this case it's actually not that far off so it just barely moved it but it's still a pretty good idea to just go ahead and hit that level button. Now that we have our settings for this first image let's go ahead and come down here to our our strip here and we're going to shift click to select all five of our images. We don't want to select the the one of the fireworks because we're going to edit that later. But we're going to, once we have all five of these images selected, we're going to click the sync button. Make sure everything is checked except for local adjustments. We didn't make any here so it doesn't matter but I usually make sure that that's not checked. And then go ahead and hit synchronize. And you'll see that's synchronized the settings that we just created up to all five of these images. Now that we have that with all five images still selected, we're going to right click, go to export, and choose Photomatix Pro. And if you install Photomatix, you're going to want to make sure that you also install the Lightroom plugin, and that's going to allow you to export directly from Lightroom to Photomatix. So I'll go ahead and hit that, and it's going to pop up this button here and we're just going to make a couple selections. Uh, in this case this was taken on a tripod so we want to click tripod leave crop aligned results checked. There's no ghosting in this because he took this with no people so there's nothing to fix ghosting out so I'm going to uncheck the box show option to remove ghosts and on reduce noise I'm going to choose all images and since we already got rid of the chromatic aberrations, you can leave the reduced chromatic aberrations unchecked. Uh, this button here is up to you. I leave it unchecked because of my workflow, but you can check this box if you'd like once you create the image in Photomatix for it to come back into your Lightroom library. So let's go ahead and hit export, and we'll give it just a minute here to churn through the images. Export them over to Photomatix. And depending on how fast your computer is, this can take quite a while. I've got a pretty beefy system, so it doesn't take that much time. But when I do this on my laptop, which is an older machine, it, uh, it can take uh, up to 10 minutes to process these images. So just be patient if you're on a slower machine. And you can see here we're in Photomatix. Now, because I use Photomatix a lot, it pulled the last settings that I used. So what I want to do is come down here to the presets and click on natural and that's going to set all of my sliders back to zero so that I can work with them on this image. Now the first thing that I do usually is I'll take this strength and I'll just kind of slide it both directions to kind of get a feel for how it's affecting the image. And you can see you, you push the strength this way and you get kind of a a stronger image in the lights. The lights get brighter and then if you go this way it gets a little less bright. Uh, I think for this image I'm gonna pull the strength down to probably right around 1-3 and then I'm gonna come and work on the brightness. Um, it's actually a little bright for my taste for what I'm gonna do with the midtones so I'm actually gonna pull that down as well. And that'll help us get back some of this detail in the lights. So maybe something like 1, 9, 1, 1, 8. That looks good. Now, shadow contrast. And if you don't know what these sliders do, if, as you hover over each one, you get a really nice description down at the bottom that tells you what each of these sliders do and how they, they kind of affect your image. So for my shadow contrast, I usually go anywhere between one and two points. One, three looks pretty good. Local contrast, as a rule, I always do 2.3. I don't really know why. If I go less than that, it seems to be a little soft. And if I go higher than that, the image is too crunchy for my taste. So 2.3 is... 99% of the time where I'll put that slider. White and black clip, uh, in this particular image I'm not going to touch those. We may touch on these a, a little bit in another episode but I don't I don't think we need it for this image. And then let's also mess with the midtones. 
and I'm gonna pull that down so I can get even more detail here in the lights because really the darker it gets the more detail I'm gonna get in these lights and I'm gonna be able to bring up those shadows later so two minus two four looks pretty good and I'm gonna go ahead and add a little bit of saturation uh, just because it's seems pretty desaturated at this point and then we can enhance and tweak that further in Photoshop uh, so maybe like 1.8 looks pretty good so now that we've got the settings that we're going to use for this we're going to go ahead and hit apply and Photomatics is going to do its work to apply those changes that we just made and this again can take a long time on a slower PC but mine's pretty quick now so it's going to come up with this finishing touches slider we're not going to finish the image in Photomatics we're going to finish in Photoshop so you can just hit done and then we want to save this image so I'm going to come to file save as and this is really important you want to make sure under your save as type that you have TIFF 16 bit selected that's going to give us the most information in our file for us to work with in Photoshop. If you use 8-bit or JPEG, you're going to lose a lot of information. You're not going to be able to do as much in Photoshop with your file. So let's go ahead and save that. I'm just going to save it to my desktop. If you selected that button earlier to re-import back into Lightroom, when you save, it'll, it'll pull that directly back into Lightroom. So let's go ahead and we'll close out of Photomatics. I'm going to minimize Lightroom for now and we're going to go and we're going to open our TIFF file that we just created and I have TIFF files set to automatically open in Photoshop so it's going to pull right up in Photoshop and we've got nice even exposure that we can work with now that we created from the five images earlier now next let's go back and let's take a look at the fireworks picture that we had and we're going to do a little bit of quick editing on the fireworks and then we'll import those into Photoshop so alright so now we've got the fireworks and it looks like I accidentally synced earlier to the other images so I'm just gonna set everything back to zero you can also just hit the reset button and it'll reset everything um, but the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull the highlights back just a little bit and for this keep in mind that I don't care about any of this or any of the people. All I care about is the fireworks because that's the only part of this image that I'm going to be using uh, in, in the image that we were working on earlier. So I'm going to pull the shadows up just a little bit and I'm going to intensify the whites and you see that kind of gives the, the fireworks a little bit of a glow and then I'm going to pull the blacks back slightly and that's going to create some more contrast in the sky versus the fireworks to so make the sky a little darker versus the fireworks and then I'm also going to add a little bit of clarity probably about 10 points and I'm also going to add some saturation so I can make those reds really stand out a little bit more now we're going to come back down to lens correction enable remove and level and that's going to get everything set up and synced up to the way that we did our previous image and I'm going to go ahead and right click edit in Adobe Photoshop and I'm going to choose edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments because I want all the adjustments I just made to show on the copy that I'm importing into Photoshop and we've got that so I'm just going to select all Control C to copy, go back to our base image that we have, and press Control V to paste that into our workspace. So now you see we've got our original image and we've got our fireworks image that we can work with. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to get this image to only show the fireworks in this image. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to create a layer mask for the fireworks image down here create layer mask and then we're gonna invert the layer mask 
And then we're going to create a selection in our sky so that only the fireworks are showing through in this image. So I'm going to come back to my background layer and I'm going to choose Select Color Range. And I'm going to use my pointer here, my ink filler, and I'm going to click in the sky to create a selection. I've got the fuzziness at about 123, so I'm going to probably keep it around there. I want nice white selection in the sky and then all this other stuff I can fix later. So you see there we've got a pretty good selection. I'm going to come and I'm going to click on the mask that we created earlier. I'm going to choose white and with my paintbrush I'm just going to paint in in this area where the fireworks are. Oh, and make sure you have your opacity set to 100 when you do that. Otherwise, it's going to look really faded like what I just did. I'm going to come back and erase out this because I only want where the fireworks are showing through. And the selection helps us to keep from, from painting on any of this stuff here. That looks pretty good, so I'm just going to deselect and zoom in to check it out. Make sure everything looks all right, and it does. So let's zoom back out to the main screen, and let's work on some more stuff in our image here. So a new thing that I'm going to show you guys this week is the color balance tool. So what I want to do is I want to color balance this image, but I only want to color balance foreground, the castle. I don't want to color balance the sky or the fireworks. So I'm just going to control click on the selection we had earlier and I'm going to inverse that. And then I'm going to click on the color balance adjustment. That's going to create a color balance, but it's only going to affect this area here and none of the sky. And we actually probably need to fix a little bit of this, just paint out where our selection wasn't perfect earlier. And it doesn't have to be perfect. You can clean up some of this stuff once we make the adjustments. Let's come back to our color balance. And you're going to see a drop down box that has midtones, shadows, and highlights. And the really cool thing about the color balance tool is that you see here you've got your color sliders and when you make an adjustment it's only going to adjust the color if it's in the tone that you selected. So if you've selected midtones and you push it to cyan it's only going to adjust the color of cyan in your midtones. If you come to shadows and you push your shadows red it's only going to adjust where there's shadows, the red tones. So what I do is I start off, let me set that back to zero. Oops. I start off in my midtones. I look at the image and I see that it's probably a little red for right now. So I'm just going to push the cyan because cyan is the opposite of red. So it's going to get rid of the red color. And this is in our midtones. And minus 15 looks good. And then I also want to get rid of the yellow because I'm, I'm basically just trying to make this more color neutral. So I'm pushing the blues plus seven looks pretty good. And already you can see we've gotten rid of kind of that orangish yellow color cast that was over most of the image. But let's also go ahead and come into our shadows here. And on the shadows, we're going to go ahead and we're going to do kind of similar. I'm going to push... Uh, I want me one or two points, two points, three points <laughs> to the cyan, and I'm going to push three or four. Three points looks pretty good for the shadows to the blue side. And you can see now we're really getting a little bit more color neutral. Now let's also touch the highlights, but what I'll do here is because the light is more of a red and yellow, I'm going to push red and yellow into the highlights. So I'm going to push maybe eight points red, five points yellow looks pretty good. And let's just look at the before and after. You see it's 
quite a big change. It got rid of the the cast of orange and yellow and red that was over the entire image. And everything seems just to be a little bit more neutral now. So let's go ahead and now that we've got that, I'm going to put a little bit of contrast into this image. So I'm going to click on the curves adjustment layer and we're going to create an S curve. Clicking the point down here and dragging brings our shadows down and clicking the point up here brings up our highlights and that creates a contrast between the shot shadows and the highlights. Now this effect is a little strong but what you can do is after you've created this S curve you can come up and choose image, apply image, hit OK on the box that pops up and if you look at the mask what it does is it basically takes the image and does exactly what it says it applies the image has a mask on that layer and what that does as you can see is it, it helps you to get kind of a subtle effect and you can do that with color contrast uh, light contrast which is what we're doing here it's actually really really useful for for kind of controlling the adjustments that you've made alright the next thing I want to do is I want to work on some of these lights uh, there's a little bright to me. I know we just increased them, but I only want to touch on certain areas to bring them down. So I'm going to create another curves adjustment layer. And I'm just going to pull down on my point here to drop the lights. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to press Control i to invert the mask. And I'm going to choose my brush tool. I'm going to move that out the way so I can see what I'm doing. And then using probably about a 60% opacity on the brush, I'm going to start painting in all of these bright areas where the lights are especially bright. So I'm going to come over here on this sign. I'm going to paint here on this Emporium sign. I'm going to paint on these lights up here. And it's really subtle what it's doing, but it's kind of bringing down the brightness right where these lights are. You're getting more detail and I just really like to see a little bit more detail around the lights instead of having it washed out from being so bright. I like everything around it to be lit but by doing this and just kind of bringing down the brightness just where those lights are I think it creates a really really nice effect. I'm going to hit this clock here. It was a little bright as well. And you can zoom in if you're working on something a little further back. So I'm going to hit on all these lights here, that sign. Those lights there, these here. And again, I'm just hitting on kind of the, the really bright stuff to tone it back just a little bit. This one here, we've got quite a bit of brightness. Zoom out. Got a few lights back here I want to hit. And we'll hit these lights on the confectionery. And these here. And before and after. You can see you've got a little bit more detail on these lights. And I think it, it really adds to the image overall when you when you pay attention to the light detail. Uh, I know a lot of times I see images and, and the light detail is all blown out. And to me, if you can just capture a little bit of that detail, that's going to be really nice and help add for a, make a really nice finished image. So the next thing I want to do is I want to focus on some of these oranges. You've got some really cool oranges in the flowers and in these banners and in the Mickey's, the Mickey pumpkins here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a curves adjustment layer and in order to create orange we're going to come in to the red channel we're going to bring the reds up slightly and then we're going to come into blue which is actually blue yellow you drag this this way you add more blue you drag it this way you add more yellow and we're going to add a little bit more yellow because blue or yellow and red are going to create orange. And 
that gives me a really good orange color, I think, overall. So I'm going to invert my mask by pressing Control i And then, once again, I've got my brush tool selected. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to find all the areas that are orange. And I'm just going to start painting these in. I'm actually going to put this at about 100% opacity. And then if it's strong, I can dial it back afterwards. So I'm just going to start painting on the banners. All these Mickeys I want to hit. And you can get a little bit more accurate than I am if you've got the time, but I'm just doing it quickly for the sake of this tutorial. Get all these flowers, because they or leaves, because they've got a lot of orange in them. Get the fall colors. Got some more banners up here. And we've got these leaves over here that I missed. Let's just hit those. Got one here on this pole. And we got some more banners back here in the back. Before and after. And you see it's, it's really subtle, but it makes the oranges pop. But it makes the oranges pop only where we want them, which is here on the Mickeys and on the leaves. Whereas before we had that huge orange color cast, now we've kind of focused that to be only specifically where the orange color should be. All right, so the next thing I want to touch on are these green colors, both in the trees and on the buildings here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on our background layer. And in order to make a mask to just cover the green colors, I'm going to come to select color range and I'm going to click in the tree area. Let me set this to grayscale so I can see what kind of selection I'm getting. And I'm going to drop the fuzziness so that it's really only selecting the green colors. If you bump the fuzziness, it's going to select a lot more. And I really only want it to touch these localized spots. So that gives me a pretty good selection of just my green colors. So I'm going to hit OK. And then I'm come up and create another curves adjustment layer. Come into our green channel. And we're just going to bump that ever so slightly. Drag it to the top. And you'll see that it adds just a little bit of green, both in our buildings and in our trees, which looks pretty nice, I do think. The next thing I want to do is I want to work on the saturation of the image overall. So I'm going to create a hue saturation adjustment layer. But instead of just dragging up the master saturation, which is going to equally saturate all of the colors, I'm going to saturate each of the colors individually. So I'm going to set my master to zero. I'm going to come into my red channel and I'm going to pull up the saturation slider for my reds. Uh, something about 17 points looks pretty good. I'm going to come into my yellows. And I'll give that maybe four points. Greens, again, it's only going to affect kind of the trees and these buildings over here. I'm going to give that about five or six points. Cyans, we don't really have a lot of cyan anywhere in this picture. Maybe a little bit over on the confectionery sign. So I'm just going to leave that at zero. And we do have blues and magentas. So I'm going to just increase the blue, which is just affecting the castle really. Probably about seven points and there's not really any magenta so I'm going to leave that at zero for this um, there is a little bit of magenta here that's reflecting from the blue of the castle creating magenta um, but I'm going to I'm going to fix that and make it a little bit more stand outy that's a word uh, by making another hue saturation adjustment layer and I'm going to come down to the blues and magentas and I'm gonna pump those up quite a bit you see we're getting quite a bit of saturation here on the rails getting a nice 
reflection of that color but it also messed up everything else so I'm just going to invert the mask by pressing control I and I'm going to select my brush tool and I'm just going to paint in here on the rails and that really helps the reflection from the castle the color reflection from the castle stand out along the rails it looks really cool I think when you do this and you can do this on a lot of images where you have color reflection you can do kind of a a masked adjustment of the hue saturation to make the reflected colors pop just a little bit more so I want to get all of this nice and good all right all right so the next thing I want to do is I'm gonna create another curves adjustment layer and I'm gonna come into the red channel and you'll see here we've been dragging from the point before to show you how to increase decrease the colors but you can also drag from the handles here and what that does or what I'm trying to do here is I'm actually trying to add a little bit of red but only in the highlighted areas you'll see this slider down here is is moving so what it's pumping red into the highlights and only the highlight regions so I'm just giving that a little bit of red because I felt like it was a, a little little under what it should be I think that looks pretty good but what I want to do is I don't want it in the fireworks back here up here is fine but I don't really want it in these bursts so I'm just gonna select black with my brush tool and I'm just gonna paint that out and do that on the castle too. Zoom in. It looks like we've still got some people from our mask earlier. Let me just fix that real quick. Select black. Paint them away. All right, that's fixed. Double check our curve. And that looks good as well. The next thing that's really standing out to me at this point is this yellow on the building over here. Um, it's kind of strong and I'm not a big fan of it. So I'm going to show you a way to neutralize that that we haven't done before. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a new bl layer, blank layer by hitting Control Shift N. Hit OK. Now we've got our blank layer. And I'm going to choose the brush tool, and I'm going to, while holding Alt key, I'm going to come and I'm going to click on the color of the wall. And you'll see I've got the, the color that's in this brick here selected. And I'm going to take the brush tool, and y'all are going to think I'm crazy, but we're going to just paint 100% opacity over all the area where this brick is. I know it looks terrible, just bear with me just a minute. And it's going to make sense. All right, so I've got that covered pretty good. What we want to do now is we're going to hit Control I to invert the color. We're going to come up here to our blend mode and we're going to choose color. And we're going to drop the opacity down to about four, three, four, five percent, something like that. Probably five percent. And let's just look at the before and after. You can see that by doing that, it really neutralized the strength of the yellow color. Let me just show you before, after. It really toned that down quite a bit. And you can do that with any color that you want to tone down. You can select the color, invert that color, and then use this same method of using the, the color blend mode and dropping the opacity down and you can use that to neutralize a color that you may think is a little bit too strong in your image. So let's keep working with our color. Another thing that I notice is the red tones on the concrete here on the left don't really match the tones here on the right. This is a little bit brighter tone than this so I want to fix that. I'm just going to come and I'm going to create another curves adjustment layer. I'm going to click on the reds. I'm going to click this little hand 
tool here and I'm gonna come and I'm gonna click over here on the red that I want to increase and I'm gonna drag it up but now you see everything's red again we're gonna invert the mask and in order to get it to match the other side a little better we're only gonna paint in on the opposite side I'm gonna paint 100% opacity and then just dial it back with my opacity slider for the layer if you mess up you can paint away with black I'm just gonna paint all this concrete here and again you can take a little bit more time doing something more serious I just want to do it quickly for the sake of this tutorial and let's close that and kind of compare it's probably a little bit too much so like I say I'll just dial back the opacity now you can see that matches a lot better. Both sides now have a nice red tone to it and it just brings color symmetry to the whole image. A lot of people think about the symmetry of the image as far as you know what's there. I mean it's nice and symmetrical as far as you know there's the train tracks to, or the tracks right down the middle um, but a lot of times people ignore color symmetry. I think that's just as important. So be sure to think about that when you're working on your images as well. Uh, one other thing that I'm noticing is now the image overall has kind of a green color cast so I just want to pull that back just a little bit by creating a curves adjustment and pulling back the green I mean it's it's very very slight I, I feel like I'm hypersensitive sometimes to these colors so maybe I'm being a little crazy but just ever so slightly and I think you can tell when you do the before and after. That's the before and you can kind of see the green now look it's much more magenta now. I think it looks a lot nicer that you've got rid of that green color cast. Alright the next thing I'm going to show you guys is pretty cool. What I want to do now is I kind of want to make the light glow a little better. Uh, specifically the yellow light here and maybe some of the orange light here. So I'm going to create a new blank layer Control shift in hit OK and I'm gonna sample the yellow color from Mickey's eyes here it's probably a little strong so I'm just gonna dial that back push it a little bit more to the yellow region and I'm gonna choose my brush and I'm gonna set it at 20% opacity and I'm just gonna start painting everywhere that the light kind of is on Main Street. So down the edges here, sides here, all of this. Now that doesn't look very good, but what we're going to do is we're going to come and we're going to change the blend mode to soft light. And you'll see instantly it kind of blends a little better now that we've changed it to soft light and everything seems to be glowing. But in order to fine tune it a little bit more, we're going to create a layer mask and we're going to do the trick image apply image. Hit OK and now you can see kind of a really big difference. Now it just looks like that yellow that we painted is just the light from all these lights making the streets here glow. Look again, there's the before, there's the after. I think it adds quite a bit to the image to do that. Now we're going to do the same thing with these orange colors. We're going to sample, oops, maybe create a new blank layer first sample your orange color right about there and uh, choose your brush tool. I'm going to do about 10% because this is a stronger color and I'm going to do it really focused so right there on the Mickey's is about the only place that I want it just hit all these choose soft light again and it's already pretty subtle so I don't think I'm gonna apply the image on this one but I am gonna bring the opacity down to about 79, 80%. 80%, that looks good. Okay, let's also, what we wanna do to make these fireworks appear more realistic as far as being in the image, we're gonna create another blank layer and we're gonna sample this red color which is actually more of a pinkish color, but 
sample, something like that is pretty good. And using our brush on the blank layer we just created, I'm going to do about 30% opacity. I'm going to come here about to where I think the color from those fireworks would be reflecting on the ground and I'm just going to paint in a little bit of color. I'm going to come and let's see, uh, overlays a little too much. So we'll do soft light and again we'll create a layer mask, image, apply image. And I'm also going to dial the opacity back probably to about 50%. Now you see we've got kind of a color cast from the firework here. But we also want to do the white from these fireworks. So we're going to do control shift in for a new blank layer. Choose the white color and we're going to paint that closer to the castle because the white would be reflecting here in this part of the image. The red higher up would be reflecting further down here which is why we painted that. So I'm going to just paint white back here. Soft light create a layer mask, image, apply image, hit OK. Let's take a look at the difference and try to about 80% opacity once again. I'm going to group these two layers just so we can see the difference. Now you see we've got kind of the glow from the fireworks coming onto the street and it just helps to blend the two images together to make it feel a little bit more realistic that these two images were taken together and, and not apart like they actually were. So we've gotten really close now to the end guys. What we want to do is we just want to do a control alt shift and E to stamp visible and we're going to come up here to filter, sharpen, smart sharpen, 200% 1.7 with 10% noise reduction and we're going to hit OK. Go ahead and hide that layer and come to channels, control click on RGB, it's going to make a selection of the image and then come back and hit layer mask. Alt click on your layer mask and go to filter, stylize, find edges, which is going to give you this kind of weird looking image. We're going to invert that and we're going to choose control L and we just want to move these sliders a little closer together so we've just basically got black and white color. Now I don't really want to sharpen my fireworks so I'm going to select my mask from earlier and I'm going to paint the fireworks out black. When you sharpen fireworks, at least to me, they always seem too crisp and fireworks to me should be a little softer. So I'm just going to paint those out so that they're not included in the sharpening. Deselect that and then finally we're going to blur, Gaussian blur, three pixels. And that's going to give us a nice mask for our sharpened layer. Which now I'm going to unhide and we've got sharpening applied to this image. Now this next step is totally optional but I'm going to again just control alt shift E to stamp visible and I'm going to come in with my hill brush tool and there's quite a bit of little junk on the ground and I'm just going to choose the hill brush proximity match and I'm going to change my spacing to 1% and I'm going to come in and I'm just going to start clicking on all these little spots on the ground and you're probably thinking this is a little obsessive this guy's crazy what is the point of cleaning up all this debris on the ground? There's not a ton in this image, but depending on when you take your pictures, if the cleaning crew hasn't come through yet, there can be quite a bit of debris on the ground in these images. And I think people don't even realize that it's there when you're looking at the image overall. But when you take a look at the end after I've kind of stamped all this and look at the before and after, I think you'll see it makes quite a big impact if you go through and fix all these little tiny details. And I'm not fixing every single thing. I mean, you don't want it to be completely unrealistic. I'm going to fix that crack there, that there. But you just want to kind of get the things that stand out the most 
and fix those. And then when we zoom out here in just a second, you're going to see what I think is a pretty big difference between having not fixed it and fixed it. So let's just finish up a couple more spots here. There's nothing too major over here, but we'll hit a couple spots. Oops. If you make a mistake, Control Alt Z fixes it. And that looks pretty good. You can spend a ton of time just getting all this little stuff, but I'm going to I'm going to stop now just to kind of show you. And if you look down here in the details, before and after. It just it really cleans it up. And I think really just gives that finishing touch to the image. Uh, and like I say, you can you can go on and do that to your heart's content and clean up every little little detail and I think it just it's going to make a big impact on some of your images, especially the ones where there's probably a little bit more debris than others. Um, I think that's going to do it for this week, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this week's edit. I'm going to be uploading uh, a copy of one of my photos that uses the same technique. So it's going to be five a five image bracket along with some fireworks. I'm going to upload that so you guys can download that and do some edits of your own using these techniques and I'd love to see what you guys do with it so if you want to hit the link in the description field on YouTube grab those files and do your edits be sure to show me what you guys come up with I'd love to see them and look forward to seeing you guys next week Welcome to part two of week two I'm Jordan Lake and here we have a photo that Matt and I critiqued back in part one. Thank you to Nick Daly for sending this in. Now from its info in its EXIF data, the photo looks like it was taken with a smartphone. So there's not a whole lot of choices for shooting other than in JPEG format. However, I would like to use this photo as an example of what happens when you choose to shoot in JPEG versus shooting in RAW. A RAW photo is just that a photo that contains all the raw data from the exposure on the sensor. A simple way to look at the benefits of raw versus JPEG is this example. Each pixel in a JPEG image is pretty much stagnant. Whatever color it is, it is. There is no more data in that pixel. In raw though, each pixel has more details that allow the photographer to push or pull that pixel in different directions. Now, this is just a conceptual example. There is a lot more technical work and theory that is going on behind the scenes. If we try to do this with the JPEG pixels, we are left at the mercy of Photoshop or some kind of photo editing software to interpret how the pixel can transform. When we put this concept together with all the pixels, a JPEG just cannot give us as much dynamic range that a raw photo can. Sometimes you'll hear photographers brag about how they don't need RAW. Perhaps they assert that they get the exposure right in the camera the first time, so all they need is a JPEG. Well, for some types of photography, this is okay, but if you're looking for dynamic range in your landscape shots, you're going to have to introduce editing at some point. For an example, take a look at this image that I shot. There's no way that this photo could have been achieved in a single JPEG shot. In fact, it's a composite of two nine-shot HDR images stitched together. I had to edit the photo to get it to look like this. Well, if I haven't convinced you already, consider the final reason. When you shoot JPEG, you will always introduce some kind of compression. Even if you set your camera for zero compression, the JPEG file format always introduces some kind of compression. So going back to Nick's photo here, you can see that this image has considerable compression, and we're going to fix that in a minute. But if you want to get to the next level with your photos, starting out with a data format that automatically reduces quality when you save just isn't going to work for you. So if you can, by all means, try to switch over to RAW. So now let's analyze this photo and figure out what we're going to do. Obviously, we're going to fix the JPEG artifacting. Um, we're going to clean up some of the edges. Uh, we're going to increase the contrast and color. 
and we're going to try to draw the uh, viewer's eye into the center here because this is this is for me at least is where I want to look. I want to see this pool. I want to see more of the waterfall, and then we're going to increase the sharpness. And to give you an example of where we're headed, um, we're going to we're going to end up making it look like this. So let's get started. I'll get rid of this, and we'll begin. So the very first thing that we want to do in reducing this is we want to create a duplicate of this layer, uh, Control or Command J. Um, you can also drag a layer onto this new layer button and it'll create a duplicate. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to the filter menu, we're going to go noise, and then we're going to reduce the noise. Uh, luckily for this photo, all the noise that we're trying to work with is in this particular area, so we can really crank uh, the strength up. We don't care about the details. We want to reduce the color noise and we want to remove JPEG artifacting. And what's happening in all the rest of the area and all the detail of the photo um, is of no concern because we're going to mask all the other stuff that we don't care about out. So we hit OK. And now we're going to come down here and we're going to hit L or Option and add a layer mask. And that's going to add a mask for us. And it's going to be black, so our original photo on the layer below is showing through. So this um, reduced noise layer is not being affected by our view, so we, we can't see that yet. And now what we're going to do is we are going to paint back in where we want our noise to be reduced. So what we'll do is we'll make sure that our mask here is selected. We can hit D on the keyboard to bring up our our default colors. Hit B for our brush and we want to choose for this particular area we kind of want to choose a rather uh, hard brush and our opacity will set to 20 percent and we'll just come in here and we'll just start painting in the reduced noise layer and you'll notice how the uh, the noise just starts to melt away. You'll also start to notice that the edges here um, are starting to, to, to come out. You can actually start to see where the JPEG artifacts in these edges here are really starting to pop out. And we'll take care of that next. But we want to take care of these, these larger areas first. You see down here. What I'm focusing on are large areas that don't have um, a whole lot of detail. Uh, because when we reduce the noise, it reduces the detail. So I just want to focus on smoother areas. And usually smoother areas is where you'll find a lot of noticeable um, JPEG artifacting. The artifacts are actually everywhere in this photo, but because um, there's so much texture, your eye looks at the contrast in the texture, and you can't see the, the faint uh, square lines. But when we get to a part where it's smooth, our eyes pick up on, on that right away. So I'm just focusing in on the uh, smoother parts of the image and painting back in our reduced noise layer. So if I hit Alt and I click on um, our mask here, this is what I've painted in for our layer. So the next thing that we want to do is we kind of want to um, get rid of these these jagged edges just a little bit because if we zoom out to me I can see that I mean they pop right out to me um, and that's a clear sign of J JPEG compression so um, there's a couple ways that we could do it but one of the fun ways is painting painting them out so let's create a new layer we get our brush tool and we kinda wanna match the hardness of this edge um, we want to match the hardness of this edge right here. So I'm going to set the hardness pretty hard, but not too hard. And I'm going to take, I'm going to press the I key to get my eyedropper. And I'm going to be working back and forth between my eyedropper and my brush tool. Um, you can also hit the Alt key. So if you want to go back and forth and sample a color, then hit your B key and then 
brush in the color, you can do that. Or you can hit your Alt key and sample a color and brush. So let me start over. I got my Alt key and I'm going to sample a color. I'm going to reduce my opacity of the brush to 20% so we don't have any real hard lines. And I'm just sampling the colors from, from around these edges here, constantly resampling. And this is, this is going to take care of those jagged edges. Now, fortunately, this isn't the, the jagged edges aren't too heavy. And when we're painting in here, it doesn't have to be too drastic. And so we don't, we aren't getting a real thick, heavy line. Usually when you start painting over a photo, your, your, your paintbrush is very, very smooth. The color is very smooth, but the photo has grain. You can see the grain in the photo and that doesn't get introduced in any of the brushes. Um, and I'm, I'm going to show you how to fix that just in case you need to put grain back into it. Otherwise it can look a little, a little fake. I don't really notice it here, but I'll show you how to do it. You're going to go up to filter noise and then add noise. Um, and then you just change the amount until um, it looks good and it looks uniform. Um, in this particular photo, about 0.5 looks okay. It's not really needed. Um, but that's how we paint out the edges. And what I would do is I would just, um, I would just continue painting, going around. I should have added my noise af after I finished all of this. But you can just continue going around, trying, making sure to match, match the colors, watch the tones. Try to match the tones as closely as possible and try not to get too close to the edges. Otherwise, you can clip an edge like that um, and it, it can get pretty ugly quickly and you're going to lose the um, reliability of what you're trying to do there. So that looks pretty decent. Okay, so the next thing <clears throat> that I want to do is I kind of want to increase the contrast uh, in these darks because these darks um, really should be falling off to black and we're getting a lot of white noise and that's the inherent properties of JPEG. Um, if this was a RAW, we could do this in Lightroom and affect the pixels and these would fade off gracefully. We wouldn't get kind of this odd color in the shadows. So what we can do is we can add a curves layer and this is obviously going to affect all the photo, but we're, gonna, we're going to invert the mask and paint, paint back in uh, where it's dark. So I kind of want to bring I want to bring down the darks obviously because that's where what I want to affect. Um, so I'm going to bring this down to about there, and I might bring this up just a little bit. Let's see, about there. Um, and this looks horrible for the whole photo. So what we're going to do is we're going to invert it and we're going to take our brush. Um, let's see here, let's get a nice soft brush and we're going to go down to 20% opacity and we're just going to, we're going to brush in this, uh, this darkness and this, this is going to increase the contrast quite a bit in these dark, in these dark areas. We can, we can also kind of increase the contrast on some of these facing rocks here and underneath. What I'm trying to do is create a, a dark area that the person's eye, viewer's eye can go into. I'm also kind of looking for um, other areas that are pretty similar in contrast that I want to fix. So these, all, these areas here are, are pretty good, pretty good candidates. They're all relatively the same. Just fixing the contrast here. All right, so let's group these together. And we can just call this 
fix JDs. All right, so we added some con uh, some contrast into the darks. Now let's add just an overall S curve to the photo. And I do this quite a bit. This kind of incre this will really increase the the highlights and the shadows together. Um, this looks just about right. Yeah, somewhere in there. And we are going to invert it and we are going to draw in, I'm gonna increase my brush to about 80%. And we're gonna draw in where we want that contrast. And this is gonna bump, this is gonna bump the color up. <clears throat> and it's also gonna kind of give the eye the ability to read shape a little bit better. So as, as you can see just already, um, we're already kind of pulling stuff out from the foreground and the, and the background. So the next thing that uh, I want to do is I want to kind of increase the brightness of these uh, little falls here. And because it's JPEG, and because I don't have a much, I don't have much latitude with it, and and this is already clipping. What I think I'll do is I'll approach it an opposite way. I'm actually going to create a, another curves layer. I'm going to bring the the whole image down, and then I'm going to take my brush, and at about thirty percent, I'm going to just going to paint out where I want the uh, waterfalls to be bright. So this is this is giving the opposite kind of pseudo effect that we're brightening it up and that way I don't have to paint over the part that's already white but I can increase the contrast in the ones that I want and what we're going to do is we're going to we are going to bump up um, the levels on on the photo overall at the very end uh, and over the course of some of the other layers that we work with Now I'd like to work with the water, and there's nothing wrong with it being green. Um, you might like it. I'd like to see it a little bit more blue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a curves, and we're going to change each individual level, red, green, and blue, to make it a little bit more blue. And I've done this already, so I'm going to just go, I'm going to explain it as I go. But I already have the numbers that I want to use. So what I'm doing is I'm adding a point, and then for this red point. I'm going to set it to 25 and 0. And what we're doing here is we're taking out uh, the reds out of the deep, deep shadows. And then if we go over to our green, I want to take this point and I want to put just a little bit more green um, into the shadows. And I said I wanted to take out green, but you'll see why in a second. I'll push a little bit more green um, into the shadows. And then I also want to take out a little bit more of the green out of the midtone. So um, this one's going to be at 135 and 128. All right, looks it looks pretty ugly overall, but we're getting there. Our final channel that we're going to go to is blue, and we're going to bump this. We're going to bump this up to 18. We're going to keep that at zero, and our output's going to be 18, somewhere around there. And then we're going to create one final point here, and we're going to set this to 142, and our output's going to be 187. And that's going to bump the blues up in the midtones to the, to the, the highlights areas. So now all we have to do is invert the mask. And with our brush, we'll set it to about 20%. And let's make sure our hardness is at zero. Now what we can do is we can just paint in where we want the color. And 
and parts of this parts of this is already quite blue so I don't have to paint over those areas as much and then I'm gonna come back here 100% make sure I don't paint my blue over the rocks because I don't want blue in my rocks all right so let's group these together and I'll just call this overall color adjust so the next thing I want to do is since we darkened it in a previous step we want to increase um, the lightness and I just want to focus the viewer viewers eye right on the center here so we can do that with curves we can bring everything up I'm going to invert it and then hit our brush tool and I kind of want a big brush like this maybe even bigger and we're just gonna pop just a little bit right in here and keep everything else dark one final thing you can do to increase contrast in between uh, some of these rocks is a technique called dodging and burning um, and how you do that is you can create a curves layer and I usually do my uh, burning layer with a curve like this so I have this point um, in this grid vertically and about here horizontally and I invert this I call this burn and I just want to affect the luminosity and then I'm gonna do the opposite I'm gonna create another curve I'm gonna bring it up to this quadrant I'm going to invert it and I'm gonna call it dodge and then I'm going to group these together command and control G and I just call them D and B for dodge and burn okay so now on our dodge layer we can grab a brush and we kind of want a rather hard brush with a, just a bit of a feather to kind of uh, mimic the hardness of the edges of these rocks and what we're going to do is we're going to set our opacity to about 10 percent and we're just going to come up to the edges of these rocks and we're just going to dodge the edges and then feather uh, feather off the dodging just a little bit. Now we won't see too much contrast right away as we're doing it, but as soon as we hit our burn layer and we create the burning behind what we dodge that's when it'll it'll really pop out and then the before and after of it too sometimes when you're sometimes when you're working you kind of lose sight of how much you've done sometimes what I like to do is take all of my layers and group them and then just go back and forth and just see how far I've come Okay, so now we're gonna go to our burn and we're just gonna burn in behind where we dodged. So I burned right here. So I'm gonna dodge behind it and feather up. And so I, I dodged up here, so I'm gonna burn behind here and feather out. I dodged up here, so we'll we'll burn this this up here. Okay, 
The retouchers uh, for portraits do this too to contour faces. And what we're doing is we're contouring the, the rocks ever so slightly. The retouchers do this to contour the faces and the facial features. Okay, so we can turn on and off our dodge and burn, and that gives the rocks a little bit more punch, and they stand out from each other rather than kind of blending in as one what looked like a painted rock mass. And of course, the final touch is sharpening. So what we're going to do is we're going to select all of our layers, hit uh, Command or Control J, then Command E. That stamps them all down to one uh, layer. We're going to go up to Filter. We're going to go to Sharpen, Smart Sharpen. And depending on the size of your photo, these settings change. Um, for this photo, it is a very small photo. So the radius can't be very big. Um, if you're not familiar with sharpening, all sharpening does is it tries to find an edge and it will create a highlight on one side of the edge and then it'll create a shadow on the other side. That's all sharpening does, at least in Smart Sharpen. Um, it has some other algorithms to make it smart, of course. You'd have to ask Adobe what they do uh, in particular, where they find the edges, but that's what sharpening is, is it adds a highlight to one edge and a shadow on the other. So the radius is how big those added lines on either side of the edge are. So if you have a very high res photo, your radius can be larger. Um, an edge of the rock in this particular photo might be only one or maybe two pixels. Um, and in another photo that's very high res, an edge might consist of four or five pixels, depending on the resolution. So that's why in a lower res photo, you need a smaller radius. And the amount is basically the opacity of the highlight and the shadow of the sharpening. Now, I only want to sharpen certain areas of the photo. I don't need to sharpen everything. And this is to taste, but I'm going to hit uh, Alter Option and hit the add mask. So now we don't have we don't have any sharpening and all I really want to do is apply sharpening to the rock areas. So I'm just going to paint in the rock areas, especially down here. There's like a lot of detail down here, especially in the plants. You can see how they they pop out. I kind of want to avoid some of the the areas that have a smoothness to them like right here I wouldn't want to sharpen this because this we, we already took care of that and smoothed it out and denoised it and all we would do is introduce more artifacts if we tried to paint that back in um, I kind of like keeping waterfalls um, unsharp this needs some sharpening too and this water could see what this looks like yeah this looks good let's see what our yeah so there we have it let's move this into our group so here's the before and here's the after i hope you learned something and uh, if you have any comments or feedback we love to hear it we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks again, Nick. Thanks for watching this week's episode, guys. Be sure to follow me on Facebook at facebook.com slash photography, and you can check out my website at thetimelessface.com. Also, be sure to check out Jordan's website at jordanlake.com. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.